Hello everybody. So last year at DDD Europe in the blue room, I've seen Barry giving this talk on residuality theory, and I was like, maybe you were the same. Oh, it's too esoteric. Uh. But at the same time, we were like, but it's so exciting. We lost the signal again. <laughs> it's so exciting at the same time. So luckily, at the speaker dinner later the day, um, uh, I talked about the thing I suspected the connection with domain driven design and residuality theory. So I was very happy to discuss that with Barry at the speaker dinner. And then we decided to do a talk together. And so uh, here, <coughs> here I tried to represent to the two of us working together and I tried to have something realistic <laughs> of Barry. And we try to make it, to make this theory easier to grasp for all of us DDD practitioners. And in the process, I even had a Eureka moment. So will you have a Eureka moment too during this session? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who you are? Yeah, so my name is Barry. You've heard that already. Um, I run a small company called Black Tulip Technology in Sweden. And what you need to know about me today is that I am currently finishing off a PhD within the complexity sciences and software engineering. And the subject of that PhD is a theory that I invented called residuality theory, which got Cyril all excited. Exciting, yeah, that's the word. <laughs> and I'm Cyril Martraire. I'm the co-founder of the company called Arola. We help companies do their stuff better and, and other things. And, and you know me, or I think you know me already. And so we at Arola, we are very green colors, but uh, and we help companies do their job better. All right, so how we made this session? We made it through late night discussions. I think it's gonna be <laughs> complicated now. So we had late night discussions and, um, and over this night, so Barry, <laughs> you are telling me repeatedly. Do you have a USB-C so, uh, adapter? It's a running gag. Stressors, yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay, we have residues. <laughs> yeah, I still have to make it work. So while preparing this talk, uh, every time we are discussing, Barry was telling me, hey, your favorite practices are wrong, wrong, wrong. And it was like, oh, oh, oh why? why are you so rude to me? And actually, the, it was, he was right. And your theory, uh, the feeling I had was the theory was indeed quite similar to what we do already when we practice domain driven design, especially with more experience. And the thing is, it was a paradigm shift. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, please don't bash me, Barry. <laughs> and, and yes, and Cyril found this, this very uncomfortable. Um, and what I was trying to explain to him the entire time, and I think what I need to explain perhaps more often is that when I'm saying that we need to move forward um, in our concepts and our ideas, and the way we talk about architecture, I'm not bashing what's already there. I'm just looking at it from a completely different perspective. And so... It still looks like bashing. <laughs> <laughs> it might do, it might do. So, what I've actually come up with and, what, and, the, and the way that I see architecture is very, very different um, than what's gone before. And the way I see that architecture works, and one of the things I hear all the time from people who are passionate practitioners of architecture, and I'm telling them that we have this new theory, is they say, but we already deliver successful projects today. We do things that actually work. So how does that happen? And if it already works, why do we need a new theory? And what I want to introduce you to is the idea of a Deleuzean walk. And this is based on the ideas of a writer called Deleuze, a, a French writer from, who wrote a book in the 1960s about how we come to know something, how we come to contemplate something. And very often, the way that we learn things is to just describe them. And we think that we know things by describing them and their attributes and their properties and putting them into a group. And we say, it has a paw, it has a tail, four paws, it says meow, it must be a cat. 
Deleuze, on the other hand, said that the way we gain knowledge is more like how we go for a walk. Whenever we arrive in a new place, and we, let's say you move to a new town and you go for a walk, and the first time you go for the walk, you walk, you're trying to find your way, and you're mostly concerned with not getting lost. You're not really sure where you are. You're not paying attention to all the details around you. The second time you go for the walk, you might be paying a little bit more attention to what's happening, and you realize that in that house on the corner, there's an angry dog, and maybe I want to take a shortcut there. And the next time you take the walk, you'll realize there's a nice wooded glen, and it's nice to walk through. And the next time you take the walk, it's a particularly hot day, and you realize that that nice wooded glen is full of mosquitoes. And you don't want to take a walk there every single time. And every time you take the walk, it's a little bit different, even though it's the same walk. And you build knowledge not by studying a map, but by taking the walk and taking the walk and taking the walk and building up this catalog of small differences until your knowledge of that walk is indistinguishable from the differences and the differences are indistinguishable from each other. And there is no such thing as a walk which you can describe in one sentence. It's a culmination of many, many small differences realized through repetition. And this is very much how we as architects, and I see lots of you nodding, this is how we experience the systems that we work in today. We don't just learn them by looking at them and categorizing them. And so the Deleuzian walk is an important principle and an explanation for how traditional architectural methods work. And this is the book. That's the book, yeah. So that's what you said. And so it's, it's not the same as looking at a map of the it's, walk, it's right? It's absolutely not the same as looking at the map. If you go back a slide. Um, basically, what architects do is they figure out how to make this walk happen. And every senior architect who's capable of delivering solutions consistently in, in, in situations where there's high complexity have figured out how to make this happen. They've figured out how to go on many, many walks and, and pick up the differences as they go on those walks. And we have very many different ideas how to trigger those walks, how to get permission to go for a walk. Sometimes we call it requirements, sometimes we call it risk, sometimes we call it modeling. And all of these things that we do as architects in traditional architecture, the funny thing is that the results don't matter. So if you do requirements engineering, have you noticed a great difference in your architectures if the requirement specification is neatly printed out and follows a template and all of those things? Or if you've written it on post-it notes, it doesn't make any difference. The results of these processes, these things that we do, don't actually matter. Because what they do, what they actually do, these tools, they trigger us to take in a walk. And every time we take a walk, we notice the differences. We notice the angry dog. We notice the mosquitoes. We notice that at this particular house, there's always a nice cat that I want to stop and pet. And all of these things, the goal of them is not what they say they are. It's so weird because we go on courses to learn how to do them better and produce better artifacts out of these processes. The artifacts aren't what we do. It's the journey, the learning, the noticing of difference. And this is very similar to saying that the map is not the territory. Residuality makes this explicit. And what it says is, let's get rid of all the ceremony and all the artifacts and all the things that we do, and let's just find a way to trigger that walk quicker and faster and look for differences quicker and faster so that we can lose all of the ceremony around all of these tools and things that we've been doing more or less without really understanding why for many, many years. Which brings us to the question, what is residuality theory? What is residuality, Barry? What is it? I don't know. What's on the next slide? Yes. Oh, so we have this concept of criticality which is absolutely vital to understanding this theory. Criticality is the condition that a system reaches whenever it's able to respond to a changing environment. What makes a system able to respond to a changing environment? Every system can be described uh, as a function of two things. N, which is the number of nodes in a system, and K, which is the number of links between those nodes in the system. 
or the average number of links. And some systems have a very low number of modules, a very low N, a very low number of agents, and some systems have a very high number of components and a very high number of connections between them. So think monolith microservices. And in between these two things, we have a line. And that line is very well known as the edge of chaos. We can also call it criticality. And what we want to do when we build an architecture is we want to reach this edge of chaos because at that edge of chaos, a system is sufficiently complex to survive, enough to survive in its environment. If a system has a very low number of modules and a very low number of connections, it's incredibly vulnerable to changes in its environment. When if one piece of it gets broken, huge chunks of the system will cease working and it will be very, very hard for that system to cope. If you go all the way out and have very high N and very high K, that system will be erratic and hard to manage and very, very difficult for an operations team to take care of. And any of you who have done any extensive work with microservices have already found this out. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and what, we, what happens is when you introduce a simple system into an environment, it will get stressed. And when it gets stressed by something in the environment, it has two choices. It either splits into smaller pieces and survives, or it dies. And this happens repeatedly. And as we stress the system, as we push it around, it splits and divides, and it forms, and it finds a structure. And as we push that structure around, it moves closer to this edge of chaos. It moves closer to criticality. And when your system is critical, when it is at criticality, then it will have the ability to survive things many things, things that you haven't even designed it for, which was the focus of last year's talk. And so this property of criticality is incredibly important. And it's whenever we work as programmers, as software engineers developing code, our focus is correctness. We want to write code correctly, code that passes tests, code that does what we thought it was going to do. If you're an architect, your job is not correctness, because there's no such thing as a correct architecture in a complex system. There's only variations on that. There's many, many permutations. And so the goal of architecture, of software architecture, is not correctness, uh, which we've long thought it was. It's actually criticality. So residuality is the modeling of systems in terms of residues. Instead of processes and components, we model in terms of residue. A residue is whatever is left over when the system is stressed, whenever the system is hit by something that we weren't expecting. And what happens is that we are investigating our architecture by repeatedly stressing it. And every time I stress that architecture, it's like getting a dog. I now have to go for a walk. It's not a choice anymore. And residuality also, provi <laughs> residuality also provides an underlying theory of software architecture with this concept of the Delusian walk and the residue. It provides a theory for why architecture works that has explanatory power for almost every architectural engagement. So what problem does it solve? <laughs> oh. yeah. So what problem does it solve? <laughs> um, Firstly, it allows us to design for criticality, and we'll see how that happens and how the use of residue instead of uh, component and process allows us to, to push towards criticality. It allows us to find and design for non-functional requirements, which is if you, like I have, worked with a lot of crashed projects, is the main reason why software, where pro software architecture projects fail. It allows us to make strong decisions on our component boundaries, um, it allows us to cope with the weakness of our structural understanding of complex environments. Every time you engage with a complex environment, you naturally project a structure onto it. And that structure has very, very weak grounds, and it tends to fall apart uh, after contact with reality. And it also allows us to know when we've done enough design. There's, a, there's a, a methodology for figuring out when we're finished. And it allows us to describe our architectural process in a rigorous way. It's quite ambitious indeed, right? <laughs> and so 
how does residuality see other methodologies? And it can seem sometimes that when you're working with something new, that, like you're bashing everything that's went before. But there's nothing wrong with doing something new, and it doesn't implicitly mean that you're bashing other things. Residuality can work together with any other methodology, even if it sees the world in a completely different way. Residuality puts uncertainty and indeterminism at the center of its world. Those are the things that it works with. Those are the things that it thinks about. Whereas other systems maybe put language at the center. Other systems put, many systems put technology at the center. Sometimes we put the object at the center. Sometimes we put the server at the center. Residuality is an approach that is post-structuralist. Everything else in software engineering is structuralist. This is where the difference happens. This is why it's an entirely different paradigm. It's a huge shift, and it's why everything is different when we work with residuality. So in a sense, you are saying that all architecture is residual, at yes. least if it works? All architecture is residual, whether or not you designed it according to resi residues. All approaches to architecture that are successful can be considered in terms of residuality. It's essentially, as I explained last year, random simulation and an analysis of this NK, the number of nodes and the number of connections between them. So to me, thank you, but to me, all this is still very dry. And <laughs> so it's science. It's science. It's peer-reviewed by peers. It's, it's serious, right? It's not the, the, like the thing I, I show on stage. But it's, it's too hard for me. So, uh, yeah, it's too complicated to, to use the word from Facebook. <laughs> for me, it's just too complicated to understand. So, uh, with, from all the discussions we had together, uh, let me introduce this metaphor that, that works a little bit. Like, you know, when you go on the beach and you see stones on the beach, they, their shape, you know, tell, tells the full story. Every hit. Every collision they went through, every <laughs> all the drama in their lives reflects into their shape, which is why usually they are mostly concave, except this one. And so each stone or each piece of, of, of wood like that tells a story. And the idea is to have that for our system and construct, define, design, and architecture through this process and deliberately. That's my naive attempt at, uh, at, at do that. And we want to do that deliberately, deliberately on purpose. So if there has the algorithm for that is to start from somewhere, actually anywhere, you don't have to be stupid to, for, you don't have to start from a stupid architecture, but you could. And then you stress it repeatedly. You ignore how likely things are. And then you try to combine what's left. And ta-da, you end up with a pretty good architecture that has this criticality quality that we are looking for. So in practice, let's try to make it a bit more concrete. We start with a network of things. You forget the work of man, but... And so it's a network made of elements and links in between. So for instance, here you see 50 elements and links. In average, they have two links in between them. So what do we call the elements? What, do, what are they in practice? And they can be anything. They could be very macro level, like think bonded context, microservices, modules in your Maven or NuGet packages. They could be physical things that you put somewhere on the runtime, like tiers, servers, components, databases, queues, middleware. Or they can be very low levels, like classes, JSON contracts between your stuff, all these kind of things. They can all be seen as elements. And then, so in the, in the incidence matrix that Barry suggests to use in for the residuality theory, they would, these elements would become the columns on a matrix, on a table, basically, that, that's going to grow. Um, and then the links between them, we have links between the elements. And by links, we mean that they change together. When, when there's a change coming in, it makes the different components change alone or together. So the change could be because you have a dependency and the change propagates through the dependency, something we are familiar with, but it could be something less familiar, like an implicit coupling, and oh, there's a new change request, and bam, bam, it, we have to commit there, we have to commit there, and different things, probably, maybe, and that's still a coupling and that's still a link in terms of residuality. Yes, right? and when you don't have a functional link between your couple, uh, between your components, and, and a stressor hits both of them, this is an indication of non-functional coupling, and this is how we discover non-functional 
requirements in our architectures. It could also be a change that, that uh, on downtime change, think blast radius, something goes down, other thing goes down, boom, boom, they are, in some way, they are coupled. So, and, and so the thing changing them is what we call stressors. And stressors, basically, these are the things that stress the system. Oh, thank you very much for this definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> now, actually, anything outside of current understanding, and that's... Yeah, so anything that's outside of your current, as I said, structural understanding, the way that we try to understand anything is to categorize it. And when, when there's too much of it, we categorize it, and we categorize relations, and we call that a system. Um, and, and that's a structure that helps us to understand a complex system. Anything that's outside of your current structure will stress that structure. And if you build your software based on that structure, then the thing that's outside of that structure will also stress your software. All right, so for instance, it could be that today just happened, uh, oh, hey, you have one, one million hits all of a sudden. Yesterday it was 10, tomorrow, today it's one million, and that's good news or, or not. <laughs> And so the stressors, you list them as rows in the matrix. One, row, one stressor, one row. And then we look at the impacts. So this, there, you need, you need your experience in architecture to imagine that when we have this stress, then we, have to, it will, we will have to make changes there, there, and there, 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 and there, etc. And if you count the number of one there in total, and you divide by the number of elements, that's your k parameter, and, and this, that's the one you want to compare to your criticality objective. Yeah. So yeah. how do we, we could reduce the K, we may want, for instance, to make it lower by doing this kind of refactorings, and there can be a various kind of refactoring, but that's a common way to introduce one more element to decrease, that's, and you recognize here a lot of the things we do every day, and we bring the K from 1.2 to Less than one. Yeah, as I said last year, almost everything you do as a software architect is a, an N, is a reduction in either N or K to try and make the system more ordered. As K rises, the number of tractors in a system rises, the number of things you have to deal with rises. <coughs> so then, Moving when, on. <laughs> whenever we do these refactorings, we lock them, in, we lock the decisions in an extra column. We, in the same way, in, they are very similar to architectural decision records, if you know them. So that's one more column to track that. And then you try to combine, to recreate from scratch uh, an architecture that would combine all of them. You pull it, and that, tada, that would be a good architecture. Or to be sure, we have to stress it to, to go through all the stressors again. And, and at the end, it's up to you. When you got that, you don't have to build it uh, entirely up front. Yes. Then, so the stressors that we use are entirely imaginary. They have no foundation in reality, and they are not probabilistic. And you're not allowed to talk about probability. It's one of the rules of this. You're not allowed to say that's likely to happen or that's not likely to happen, because in, when, we, when we do that, we introduce bias. And we usually introduce bias from the most powerful people in the room who restrict the structure to what they want to believe in. Um, and there's a few other things that we don't want to bring in either. One of those things is cost, and I find people find this really, really difficult. We don't think about our structures, we don't think about how they can be impacted, because we instinctively say, no, that'll cost too much, or this is politically difficult to, to argue for, so I won't have that in my architecture. But at this stage of your work, you're still thinking. You don't need to implement everything. We're testing, we're going on walks, we're finding the cracks in the pavement. We're looking for boundaries and potential boundaries in our software that brings us closer to or further away from criticality. There's absolutely no need for us to restrict our thinking in terms of cost and risk and politics until we get to, to that stage of, of our projects. So when we have the K with the right value, then the idea is that good things will happen. That's the idea. So there are other things that we don't have the time to mention, but you don't have, I mentioned them already. And so really what you said is very, very important. You don't care about how likely the stressors are. Really, you don't. Really, 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 really indeed. So the title of this talk was to bridge the gap between residuality theory and the management design. So you already see one way is that you could, dis you could rediscover pretty much everything we take as good tools and good techniques for designing a system from first principles from this theory, given the coupling definition that we have. 
And for the rest, please don't bash me from what I say, but the way I see it is, is that um, DDD can be seen as a Trojan horse to introduce people to complexity theory. And, and actually, the other, way, the other one works as well. But the story I want to share right now is how I reluctantly, yeah, it was harmful, escaped from being trapped in structuralism to be more effective, at least according to Barry, and I hope so, you, so can you. So remember, if you come back to your souvenirs from domain-driven design, you've heard, and I learned long ago, that a model doesn't exist in absolute. It's always contextual within a context, right? And it was an epiphany to me at the time. Was it for you as well? It was like, wow, yeah, very key moment. And then Eric, in the book and in everywhere, we, we learned that from Eric that we should consider, even within one bounded context, there's no one model. We have to consider multiple alternate models. And we must be ready. We implement one, but we must, must be ready to switch to another one or find a, one more anytime. And we, and we like that. And we are proud of it. And that was really it's another epiphany moment. And more recently, in, a, in a, here on this stage, Eric mentioned that you should not even expect that every domain can be reduced to a clean, regular model, because some domains are messy, like business, marketing, people. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's not all regular. And so, you know, if you see, each time it was a little epiphany, so, oh, hey, oh, I'm a bit less naive now. And so, I, I, I would go as far as saying that domain driven design taught me how to deal with a genuinely complex system, not a, a complicated one. And as a graduate engineer, trained, grown up in a complicated world, it really it was a cure. And maybe it was the same for you, right? And now it's time for the next step, then. And escaping, but so far we, I'm still living with a world of a system, with a structure that I see, that I think about, and now is the time to go further. And the funny thing is, at some point in our discussions, you pointed me to this blog article from Matthias called the It's Just Like. And this article says that whenever you see something new, it sounds like something you know already, and, and so you say, oh, I can dismiss safely. And, and the, the article actually and says something different. It says, you should look for what's, the, what's different inside. And turns out, I was not doing that, All right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, maybe I was trying, but yeah, he was bashing too much. <laughs> yes, so I would say to Cyril that the, so we would say, well, what, what, what are we going to talk about? What do, how do residuality and DDD work together? And I would say things like, well, residuality doesn't, or DDD doesn't cover non-functional requirements. Oh, yeah, yeah, but it doesn't matter because in practice we use DDD on top and, and, and so forth. And so we and would ask something more. And, no, no, no worry because in practice we all use hexagonal architecture on top. And we use also these patterns, these contracts. And, and you know, Chris Matt says that break the model. So we already do that. Uh, by the way, who knows Chris Matt? That's, uh, you should. Re very, very, very important. Chris Matt, break the model, is very important. And all the distributed architecture, we use it on top because the mentoring design doesn't say a thing for, about that. And we have the real options and... Nah, 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 nah. Uh, and at this stage, Cyril is actually admitting that what I do in order to produce a, a good architecture as I go for lots and lots and lots of walks. It's just a different way of talking about it. All of these things, and when you say we're going to have three models or we're going to break the model, you're saying I need a trigger to make me go for walks, to contemplate this system over again. So each time I was introducing a new practice, so you are telling me basically, if you can't facilitate, if you uh, say it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, whenever you're trying to have a discussion with someone and they keep saying, yeah, but this, if their idea can't be falsified, then you might be in a cult. Yeah. <laughs> and I have I to admit that. And it felt, <laughs> it felt strange. For, I was hearing myself saying, you know, DDD says, Eric says, we all take for granted this. And yeah, it sounds like I was indoctrinated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, we, have, we even have a high priest called <laughs> DDD Borat. Still a mystery. And, and we also have a community with, with a strong identity on top and a lot of sloppy jokes. 
<laughs> as well. So yeah, there was some element of that and I was not very comfortable. So when Barry comes and says, hey, your stuff is wrong <laughs> from a science perspective, like, hey, burn him. <laughs> yeah, you can tell it, you can tell it. Burn him. <laughs> burn the witch. Uh, but yeah, but uh, you knew that and you were expecting that. So I was expecting this. Um, <laughs> And it, the story is foretold in a book that was written in 1962 uh, by a guy called Thomas Kuhn. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it talks about how the scientific community changes their mind about an idea. Um, and generally, we all work and live within a particular paradigm. And a paradigm is a set of beliefs about how the world works. And there are fundamental things that we accept as true on a social level. And Kuhn said that what will happen is within this paradigm, you will experience anomalies. Something will happen that your current theory doesn't explain. And what will happen then within the paradigm is that you'll sweep it under the rug and say, don't talk about it, it's not there. And then eventually it becomes too hard to ignore, so we, we add a little bit on, and then we add another little bit on, and someone comes along and says, no, but we use this as well, and we have this thing, and we put it on top of this thing, and then we have this big stack of stuff, and eventually it collapses under its own weight, and it's replaced by a new paradigm. If it isn't replaced by a new paradigm, it's replaced by a dark age. And <laughs> there's so many jokes I could have made right now, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so pick your favorite thing to bash and just put it in there. That was the dark age. <clears throat> um, until that happens, until that collapse of the paradigm happens, the, anyone suggesting anything outside of the paradigm will be ridiculed. And you can tell if you're working outside of a paradigm because you can hear the rustle of the pitchforks. They're coming for you. The paradigm that I'm pushing up against is not domain-driven design. It's not software development. Um, it's structuralism. This belief in the structures that we impose on complex systems. There was a talk this morning where Chris was talking about how we need to move away from the Newtonian Cartesian view that everything can be broken down into parts. Um, but whenever we replace those parts with a bunch of parts stuck together with links and call it a structure, we've just replaced the parts with slightly bigger parts. It's the same thing. Um, and so what I'm pushing up against is this structuralism, this seeking of structure, because very quickly we believe in our structures and very quickly they let us down and we've all experienced that. Um, and so if you work with requirements engineering, you have a linguistic structure that you believe in and then it falls apart. If you work with risk management, you have a probabilistic structure that you work with and that falls apart too. And we consistently believe in these structures. So um, I struggle with that a lot. Uh, and I eventually think I understood. So I, I try to share maybe my naive understanding of this. And what do we mean by structure really in, in, in our life? So, one example would be when you start a project, you start from somewhere and you evolve, uh, you go over some paths and until you end up to where you are right now. And you remember some of it. And so that's the past, all the decisions, the thinking that you had, and that's, that's also your structures in your mind, in your system, the artifacts, the code, the DB schemas, all these things. And you are a professional, so at any step, at every step along the path, you introduce options by design, because you're a good professional, so that you can accommodate changes that could happen in the, in the vicinity of where you were and where you are. And these options make you feel safe, because anything, any change that would happen within these yellow lines, the options, you are ready to deal with them. And together, all these options that you've done, that you've put, some call it the, the reversible part of your decisions, all these options that you baked in with love into your system, into your thinking, they make you safe if for every change that would fall within this bubble. And the danger is that the world is wider than that. And by the way, it goes beyond, it goes off screen. It goes, we don't even know the size of the real world. And that's, that's frightening. So the, the idea of the works is that we have a number of practices, plus you have your own experience. You've been through a lot of stressors yourself, and the more experience you have, you've just seen more stressors indeed. And so they you've kind been, of... You've been on more walks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this, all this tends to converge to something similar to what resiliency is suggesting. But still, there, it may not be enough. So we need something more. 
And so with domain driven design and all friends, practices that go with it, that, that we love to discover every year at this conference, we hope to, we can cover a lot and we feel, we, feel we feel nice about it, but what about anything else that would fall outside of it? Get it? Kind of? Yeah, you have a feel for the risk that we live into? So the residuality theory aims at exploring that through random simulations. Yes, and those random simulations, as you can see in this beautifully drawn addition to Cyril's diagram, um, it, it helps us to discover something called attractors, things that the system is pulled towards. And, and the system is made up of infinitely many possible combinations, but, uh, but not all of those are addressable, not all of those can be reached. And what, so what we're trying to do is to find the group of attractors that surround the system and build a system according to those attractors, not according to the happy path uh, that, we, that we are accustomed to. And you, the key thing is you don't have to imagine everything possible to design for it, because we are lucky for every possible stressor, the number of attractors is much less. Yes. And so we can have some safety just by going through enough of them. In technical words, the, yes. the solution recombine. And if you're interested in the mathematical explanation behind that, you can look at last year's talk that I gave on residuality theory. We're not going to do any math today, I promise. So really, it is a paradigm shift. It is, really. And it took me a lot of time to understand it. it the paradigm shift is go moving from st a structuralist point of view, which is pretty much our default, the one we don't even see, the one we are not even aware of, like being trapped within a structure, and then moving to a post-structuralist approach. And... So congratulations, everyone. You just learned a new pedantic word to feel, <laughs> to brag and impress your friends at cocktails and at dinners. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a win. <laughs> so it was hard for me to pass that because in your slide, it was kind of buried just like a detail. But it's not a detail. So by the way, I would suggest that maybe you try to, to say, to tell it out loud, the word post-structuralist, right? Would you try it with me? Post-structuralist, yeah, to have a taste for the world. Post-structuralist, yeah. It sounds good, right? It's a good world. It's a good kind of world. <laughs> just, just a quick warning. If I see a blog article called Post-Structuralist Driven Design, <laughs> I will find you. <laughs> so there are some dangers with, with bringing the concept of post-structuralism into the fray. And one of the reasons for that is in, in the analytic tradition, where we believe in logic and, and, and controlling our language, post-structuralism is seen um, and described very famously as fashionable nonsense. Okay? The sciencey people don't like this. They don't like people getting involved with it. Whenever I first discovered it, my professor said to me, Barry, you've been on the continent too long. <laughs> They're getting to you. Um, I think that it's a very, very abstract term, and it's very difficult to grasp if you're not, if you haven't worked in that realm. And so, Cyril asked me many times, "What is post-structuralism?" And the answer is, nobody really knows. <laughs> and the best introduction to post-structuralism, and I think the perfect introduction for, for the people at this conference, is a book by a South African researcher who was one of us, an engineer who went and studied philosophy in South Africa, and his name is Paul Silliers. And he wrote, a, he wrote a book called Complexity and Postmodernism, where he links all of the things that, that this audience thinks is fascinating with the complexity sciences and Kaufman and all of that cool network stuff. And he links it to the post-structuralist work of French philosophers like Deleuze, who we've already mentioned, and Derrida, who the analytics thought was, was completely insane. And, and it, it makes a connection between these ideas and the ideas that I know this audience are interested in. And so, very soon? And very soon, I, I'm, I have to upload this tomorrow, is an article is coming where I describe these concepts, an academic article which is you know, very dense and, 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 but still quite beautiful. But it, if you are looking um, for something more accessible, <laughs> residuality theory in short, you get the good punchline, is just pessimism codified. This is the, short, this is the shortcut for that very dense eight-page article. It's, it's just negativity <coughs> codified. So don't worry, we still have to work in a structure. We have to work in a structure. We can't escape the structure. So the only thing we can do is try to see it from, uh, try to see the world from as many angles and different and walks, and stop constraining your imagination by how likely things are. We said it already, right? Huh? Yeah. We so, will say it again. Yeah. So I've been teaching a <laughs> workshop on this here this week, and it's 16 people who, who, who really appreciated the workshop. 
But what you constantly have to work with is to stop putting the brakes on. Stop stopping yourself from seeing outside the structure. These structures that we believe in, they, they stunt us, they box us in. Um, and getting people to just really let go and stress their systems and feel confident in doing so is, is So we should we consider lizards with laser eyes, we should consider them. That's right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the first thing. <laughs> obviously, obviously. <laughs> so how we could we combine, how could we combine DDD, domain driven design and residuality theory? So the first thing is just by watching his talk, and I suggest you go back to the next year, last year talk. It immediately, uh, for me at least, had an impact on my practice. Like, now it's a common conversation topic for my clients, and, and by the way, they, they like it. So it's something like, what's the worst thing that could happen to your business or to your system? Or, oh yeah, we could have to enter a new country that needs a new cloud, or this kind of wow, wow, wow. And uh, I also recollected through my memories all the stressors I had met before and created lists, checklists, just to be more aware of it. And so now I can ask questions spontaneously, like what if you had to offer uh, the, your system as a white label to other kind of markets, and how would it survive maybe? And this one is likely, by the way. So another way is to use stressors to challenge your bonded context. You know, bonded context, one use of them is to split a system, for instance, a large system into microservices or modules. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the coupling can be invisible inside. And so we try, what we try to do is to have co-modifications, things that change together to be inside, not across system. So we want this, not that, right? And so in incidence matrix like we, like we use for in residuality theory, it shows quite clearly, right? So this... Yeah, whenever we see these numbers pop up in a matrix, it means that the two things that have a one in the same row are coupled to each other in a non-functional way. This is how we discover it. There's something connecting these two bounded contexts. So here on the first line, you see yeah. one and one, and on the second stressor, there's another stressor where it happens as well, so it may not be a coincidence, it may be mm. a, something, some implicit coupling, yep. and so maybe we should merge the two bounded contexts or find a, extract a common third or something like that. And that actually, actually, that's how you should think if, when you do the thing. But this is more rigorous, right? Yes, and this will work for bounded contexts, domains, subdomains, aggregates, as well as software components, as well as the functions inside your software components. So you can, all of the structure that you carry around in your head as an architect and you've never been allowed to talk about before because no one's interested, and let's be honest, you don't document it. Um, so you could see... Um, can be expressed in these matrices. You could see residuality theory or with respect to DDD and all the other around as training wheels one for the other. And for, for instance, for me, through DDD, I learned ex going from I don't want uncertainty, going through, oh, I can live with some complexity, and that was another epiphany from domain driven design. And so with residuality theory, now we are, give me more <laughs> uncertainty, and I'm happy, I want it. <coughs> and we should be fine about it. All right, so yeah, it goes so well that in your workshop, some, some, some one of you, Philip, may even rename yourself into uncertainty engineer. So yeah, <laughs> you, can turn, you can convert people. And yes, I surveyed some people out of the workshop and they told me that, yeah, going through domain driven design was a good priming uh, path to be more receptive to residuality theory. So yes, I, I, and I lucky. can say I've taught this workshop for, to hundreds of people across Europe in the last couple of years, and this audience, this uh, DDD audience, are really, you find people who think really deeply about the complexity of a system and are, and are prepared to engage with it in a completely different way. And that's been fantastic. Another use that you may use with your colleagues or friends or clients is you could use residuality theory as a way to counter some abuses or misunderstandings from domain driven design. Like some people misunderstood domain driven design. It happens, right? And <laughs> so having another theory going from another angle can help push uh, and help people understand what it really is about. Like, for instance, uh, no, it's not about modeling upfront, or, you know, this one, it's not about being modeling for realism, right? It's not, it is not about that. Or it's not about this, of course. And it's not about that either. Or, no, this one we know. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, it's not about this one, we said it before, yeah. <laughs> it's not about correctness and uh, all these kind of things. Yeah, so whenever you combine DDD and residuality, what it's going to do 
is the two influence each other positively. First, everything you do when you create a domain, you're creating a structure, and residuality will help you stress that structure and question it. And as you can see, some of the things that, that uh, Cyril noted that Eric has said earlier have more models. Um, a, a quote I saw on Twitter from Eric uh, a few days ago, start off with a naive model and just go, just start battering it. It's the same principle. What I find is that if you're not, one of the things that's really difficult, for, especially for technically minded people, is that it's very hard to stress a system. When you ask a, a senior developer to stress a system, they'll say things like the network goes down, the hard disk, disk crashes, lots of technical stress. People who engage with the domain have an easier time saying, what happens if a competitor drops their price? What happens if a competitor moves into our market? What happens if new regulations hit this thing? Um, and that's how you have to stress a system. So having domain knowledge is inescapable. And, and knowing how to engage with the domain and gather that domain knowledge will make this much, much easier to do. So the two, uh, the two fuse with each other pretty well. And, Another thing that can happen is that you can use this to confirm, have I got this right? Do I have the right domains, the right subdomains, the right bounded context, the right aggregates? I know that a lot of people who start out in domain-driven design find these things very confusing. This is a tool for confirming, have I understood this right? And if you get a whole series of ones across your matrix, then no, you haven't. Keep going. Um, it's, and I think it'd be much easier for them than abstract discussions and very long discussions about what an aggregate is. All right, so yeah, and, and one example I like is using domain driven design to find stressors better, to help maybe find some. So yeah, you still need experience and domain insights. Uh, that's the key. <laughs> we invested in that too much. But invested too much, it, it could be a sunk cost fallacy anyway. So one tool I love from domain driven design that can help spot uh, stressors is uh, our invariants that come from the blue book, you know, the Bible. <laughs> Ta da da! <laughs> Uh, if, you, uh, if invariants are not yet on your mental map, they should be. That's, they are very, 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 very important thing. So imagine we are selling products in an e-commerce system, then an obvious invariant, it's a property, an invariant, something that holds true, would be that we can sell every product in stock, obviously, right? So the key question, that's why there's a key on the picture, it's a key question, is, is this always true? And this question is not enough. You have to insist, usually. You have to insist, insist, insist. If there are a case where it would not be true, and it turns out there is. Yeah, no, because perishable products, yeah, you, hey. So now you have to review and reduce. And now, yeah, you have to take care of that. So the game there is to trying to break every properties you have to explore faster the domain. But it will still not be enough. You have to be even crazier than that to be, to be, to be effective. So now there's now the time for the closing, and so maybe that's a good summary of how we prepare the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, this talk is, uh, was, in effect, domain-driven design and residuality theory applied, because I had to interview, uh, I tried to model your brain and your theory. Yes, and my instant reaction was to stress him. <laughs> um. yeah, so that's me there, you know, <laughs> and that's him. <laughs> the giant Godzilla, and yeah. And it was stressful, yeah, indeed. Yes, and if you watch back over the films, you'll find we have history with the fire-breathing lizard thing. And a lot of people refer to me as the lizard guy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's residuality theory. Yep, and so this theory won't guide you. It won't solve all your problems. It's not some promise. It's not some silver bullet. What it will do is protect you from believing too much in the structures that you know, that you think are solid, the structures that we build. Um, and post-structuralism is very much about being suspicious of those structures and being aware of the fact that those structures will crumble and break and rebuild and crumble and break and rebuild over time, which is the very essence of residuality theory. Things are made of res residues, a series of broken stuff over time. Um, and you know you've got a good architecture and this, these ideas help you get to a good architecture by knowing when you've established criticality in the face of stress. You can skip that one. Let's skip it. Okay. So oh. you can keep your domain driven design and all the friend practices and residuality is just one way to enrich your practices and it's worth learning. And the funny thing is while preparing this talk, last night I had a bug between my application, my presentation application and the, and the drive online. So I lost everything. So I had to rebuild everything from, from an export. And so we had these little conversations and you see the conclusion? Yeah. 
<laughs> so it never happened to me before. That's how stressors work. Yeah. It's, outside, it's outside of my structure, my picture of this thing, and now Should I had happen. to go for a new walk, <laughs> and it was raining, and I had no umbrella. But, uh, we it anyway. And that's it. So I suggest you, if you haven't already, or even if you have already, watch again this talk to, for the more technical details. Yeah, the feedback I've had is that you get it on the fourth watch. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's our conclusion, residuality with end of design. It's a love affair. Thank, Thank you very you. much.